organisms up to nirvana, the vanishing point of differentiated matter, perhaps a simple diagram will aid us. So she, she is going to, to present this complete panorama of evolution. The elemental nature, which is responsible in part from our, our habits, right? Why do you think it's very difficult to stop eating chocolate? Does not apply to, that not, doesn't apply to Michael. <laughs> Have you ever tried to stop eating chocolate? And, and what happens? Suffering. Su suffering? Yes. For how long? For how long uh, it takes to stop the suffering. Yes. <laughs> Next piece of chocolate. <laughs> yes, that is, is the sign. Just, oh, no, there's something in your brain, yeah, some hormone in your brain that, well, that may be so, but that's not the whole story. According to Madame Blavatsky, the elemental, the physical element in your body has established a relationship with that chocolate. <laughs> and in order to relinquish that habit, you will need to have a conversation with that elemental. Anyhow, there it goes. So to understand what an elemental is, the term elemental usually signifies an entity or being pursuing its evolutionary experiences prior to assuming a physicalized material form. Each such elemental is a spark which issued from the pure essence and must continue the cycle of existence by mounting the hierarchical ladder of life. Each such spark represents a monad passing through the stages of preliminary kingdoms. This is Geoffrey Barborka's The Divine Plan. The composition didn't work, as you can see. So I should have back space a little. Mm. So the, and then, of course, the poor lead bitter was squashed at the bottom. It doesn't matter. Elemental essence is merely a name applied during certain stages of its, of its evolution to monadic essence, which in turn may be defined as the outpouring of spirit or, or divine force into matter. So, basically, it is a form of matter that it's non-physical, it exists in different stages, but it's an integral part of evolution. That means that it is that form that before consciousness reaches the bottommost level of materiality, which is the mineral kingdom, it has to pass through the elemental kingdom physically, emotionally, and mentally. And that's why they are part of our evolution. And what, again, remembering Dr. Carl Jung, what Carl Jung called the shadow, in some cases, can be uh, related to the elemental nature. Because its course of evolution is downwards, and therefore our direction is a different direction but it's part of our total evolution. Now, if you can understand 10% of this, I have reached 5% of understanding. Then my job is done. Now, how many of you can see this diagram here? Can you see it? She says the line AD, can you see the line AD here? The line AD represents the gradual obscuration of spirit as it passes into concrete matter. The word spirit is synonymous with consciousness, right? So, the spirit descends into matter. The point D here indicates the evolutionary position of the mineral kingdom from its incipient D here, to its ultimate concretion, A. So the spirit is gradually descending into concrete matter, the mineral kingdom. A, B, C in the left-hand side of the figure are the three stages of elemental evolution. A, B, C. <coughs> 
That means the three successive stages passed by the spiritual impulse through the elementals, of which little is permitted to be said, she said, before they are imprisoned into the most concrete form of matter, the mineral kingdom. And CBA in the right hand side, CBA, are the three stages of organic life, vegetable, animal, and human. What is total obscuration of spirit is concrete perfection of its polar antithesis, matter. And this idea is conveyed in the lines AD, AD. The arrows show the line of travel of the evolutionary impulse in entering its vortex and expanding again into the subjectivity of the absolute. The central thickest line, DD, is the mineral kingdom. Now, you can see that there is no way a scientist would cons consider this, right? Because <coughs> This <coughs> includes a view that what is called spirit or consciousness mm -hmm. has to plunge itself into matter. And we will see why in a few slides. So, before the evolution as we know begins here, mineral, mineral vegetable, animal and human, there is a prior evolution that's part of it. In other words, as the ancient Rig Veda in India said, his spirit is blind without we have new arrivals. His spirit is blind without matter. Sorry, his spirit is lame without matter. Matter is blind without spirit. So, the theosophical view of evolution is very inclusive, right? It, it, it certainly does give a role to matter in, in this whole process. And then she says, now it is universally admitted that the whole system of nature is moving in a particular direction. And this direction, we are taught, is determined by the composition of two forces, namely the one acting from that pole of existence, ordinarily called matter, towards the other pole called spirit, and the other in the opposite direction. The very fact that nature is moving show, shows that these two forces are not equal in magnitude. Of course, if the forces were really equal, that would be stagnation, right? Mm -hmm. Evolution would not proceed. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding these two forces, I had an interesting conversation with Sangdong Rinpoche in 2001 at the World Congress of the TS in Sydney. He's a former Prime Minister of the Tibetan government in exile. He's a scholar, internationally recognized. He's a teacher, and he's a reincarnated Lama. Now, a reincarnated Lama, the word Rinpoche means the precious one. So I said, you know, in the West, there is this craze about Maitreya, the return of Maitreya, or the Buddha Maitreya. I even saw a, a website of a man in New Zealand who claims to be the Maitreya. He has long hair and he has put on his website, my work is to build a new civilization and for that I need women. <laughs> I mean, he, he was very candid about this. <laughs> so I asked uh, Sandong Rinpoche and he said, according to the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, 
Maitreya will not appear before a million years. He certainly will not appear while Kali Yuga is here. Now, this is a different story because Kali Yuga only lasts for four, 432,000 years. So, we still have some time left. <laughs> uh, so, and then he said, and I have never seen this in any book, I don't claim to have read everything on the subject, but he said, in Kali Yuga, there is collective darkness and individual clarity, implying that even in this age of darkness, some individuals may find clarity in themselves. He said, but in Satya Yuga, that means the next age, the age of truth or of harmony, there will be collective clarity, but individual darkness because these two poles must be always together. In the, in, in, in the sense that in the, in the deep future, if we have that future and if Greta is allowed to become 30, uh, Gre Greta Thunberg, uh, in that future there will be a much more harmonious and just society but there will still be individuals struggling with their own darkness because that's the nature of life. Now the Mahatma Letters to A.P. Sinet, we have copies of, of this book in this library. It says, in the evolution of man there is a topmost point, a bottom point, a descending arc, an ascending arc, as it is spirit which transforms itself into matter and not matter which ascends but matter which resolves once more into spirit 